Okay, welcome everybody. This is a video podcast to accompany Chapter 5 on the skeletal system. We're going to have an introduction to the bones of the skeletal system. We'll classify bones according to their shape and describe the major types of surface features. We'll identify parts of a long bone, state the locations of compact bone and spongy bone, and describe the internal anatomy of a long bone. We'll name the three types of cells in bone, identify their major functions, and summarize calcium homeostasis. We'll compare the structure and function of compact and spongy bone. We'll summarize endochondral ossification. We'll discuss clinical disorders associated with abnormal bone growth and development. We'll describe various types of fractures and explain how they heal. We'll ID the bones of the face and cranium and ID and locate cranial sutures. We'll ID and describe surface features of the skull. We'll label landmarks seen on sectional views of the skull and ID and describe components of the nasal complex. We'll list associated bones of the skull and discuss the hyoid bone, including its functions and features. We'll define fontanelles and explain their purpose and describe key structural differences among the skulls of infants, children, and adults. We'll ID and describe the curves of the spinal column and their function. We'll ID the vertebral regions and describe the parts of a vertebra. We'll describe the distinctive structural and functional characteristics of the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. We'll describe the distinctive structural and functional characteristics of lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum, and coccyx. We'll describe the thoracic cage and explain the significance of the articulations between the thoracic vertebrae and the ribs and the articulation between the ribs and the sternum. We'll compare and contrast kyphosis, scoliosis, and lordosis. We'll ID the bones that form the pectoral girdle, describe their functions and superficial features. We'll identify the bones of the arm and forearm, note their functions and superficial features. We'll ID bones of the wrist and hand and describe their locations using anatomical terminology. We'll describe the hip bones that form the pelvic girdle, their functions and superficial features. We'll ID the bones of the pelvis and discuss the structural and functional differences between the male and female pelvis. We'll ID the bones of the thigh and leg, note their functions and superficial features. We'll ID the bones of the ankle and foot and describe their locations using anatomical terminology. We'll describe the basic structure of a synovial joint and describe common accessory structures and their functions. We'll explain the relationship between structure and function for each type of synovial joint. We'll describe clinical disorders related to intervertebral discs and porous bone. We'll explain arthritis and describe its effects on joint structure and function. So, we begin with the skeletal system. Now, what is it that the skeletal system can do for you that no other system can? Well, it's a, it provides structure and support for the body. It also provides for the ability to move at special structures called joints. It protects our internal organs. It serves as a mineral storehouse. And it is a site where blood is produced, particularly in the red marrow, which is found in the adult skeleton, in the flat bones of the skull, the ribs, in the hips, in the sternum, and in the proximal heads of the femur, in a process known as hematopoiesis. There's about 206 bones in the skeletal system. We're not going to learn all of them, but we will learn a, an appreciable number. This also includes cartilage, ligament, and connective tissue. It's divided into the axial skeleton, which includes bones of the skull, thorax, and vertebral column and forms the longitudinal axis of the body, and the appendicular skeleton, which includes bones of the limbs and pectoral and pelvic girdles. Okay, the functions of the skeletal system include support, 
mineral storage, blood cell production, also known as hematopoiesis, protection, movement. The functions depend on unique and dynamic properties of bone tissue. The skeletal system provides structural support for the body, utilizing mineralized extracellular matrix between the bone cells that are called osteocytes to provide a framework for attachment of soft tissues and organs. So in that sense, we have what's called an endoskeleton. Okay, I'll write that term up here. Blue. Endoskeleton. Since our soft parts are on the outside, when our skeleton increases in size, the soft tissues can conform to the hard parts underneath. Some organisms have their skeleton on the outside. Those are called exoskeletons. And in order for those organisms to grow, they have to molt. And their exoskeleton has to become soft for a brief period of time so that the soft tissues underneath can grow and then the external shell can reharden. The skeletal system stores minerals. The body needs to maintain normal concentrations of circulating calcium and phosphate because those are important not just in maintaining strong bone, but calcium, for instance, is critical in nerve transmission and muscle contraction and blood clotting. And phosphate is critical as a signaling molecule. It's also a structural component of phospholipids and nucleotides. So very critical that um, we keep normal concentrations of these compounds circulating. Calcium phosphate are held in reserve as part of bone structure. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. The body normally contains between 1 and 2 kilograms of calcium, and 98% of that is in bone. The skeletal system also provides protection for tissues and organs. The ribs, for instance, protect the heart and the lungs. The skull encloses the brain, and the vertebra shield the spinal cord. The pelvis cradles the digestive and the reproductive organs. The skeletal system is also the site of blood cell production. The red bone marrow that we find in the spongy bone spaces, which are between the outer compact layers of bone, are the site of production of red cells, white cells, and platelets. The skeletal system works with the muscular system to allow for movement. The bones function as levers. They change the magnitude and direction of forces generated by skeletal muscle and allow movement from delicate fingertip motion to powerful changes in body position. Bones are classed by shape into four different categories, flat bones, long bones, irregular bones, and short bones. Flat bones are thin, nearly parallel surfaces that form the roof of the skull, the sternum, the ribs, and the scapula, and protect the underlying soft tissue. They have extensive surface area for skeletal muscle attachment, while long bones are relatively long and slender and are located in the arm, the forearm, the thigh, leg, palm, soles, fingers, and toes. The femur is the largest and heaviest bone in the body, and it, of course, is a long bone found in the thigh. Irregular bones have complex shapes with short, flat, notched, or ridged surfaces. These include the spinal vertebrae, the bones of the pelvis, and several skull bones. Short bones are small and boxy and include bones in the wrists called the carpals and in the ankles where they're called the tarsals. So here are some examples of some of the different bones. You can see an example of a flat bone up top, that's the parietal bone found in the skull. Long bone, an example would be the humerus found in the upper arm, and irregular bones, the vertebrae found of course in the vertebral column, and short bones, the carpals found in the wrists. Bone markings are important because they serve as sites of attachments for muscles tendons, ligaments, and they can also serve as passageways or conduits for nerves and blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. So we need to learn these bone markings in, a in addition to learning the bones themselves. 
Characteristic external and internal features related to particular functions are called surface features. These are elevations or projections for tendon and ligament attachment. Depressions, grooves, tunnels for blood vessels or nerve passage are quite common. Examples of some of these surface features include the head, which is an expanded proximal end of a bone that forms a part of a joint. It generally fits into some type of a socket. For instance, the proximal head of the femur, which is the part that's closest to your shoulder, or I'm sorry, the proximal head of the humerus, which is the bone um, that forms your upper arm, that, that head is nearest your shoulder and it fits into a socket called the glenoid fossa. Okay, fossa is a term used for a depression in a bone. Just one example. A diaphysis or a shaft is the elongated body of a long bone. Well, the neck is a narrow connection between the head and the diaphysis of a bone. A process is any projection or bump off of a bone surface. Well, a tubercle is a small rounded projection. And a tuberosity is a rough projection that takes up a broad area, it generally serves as a site for muscle attachment. A trochlea is a smooth, grooved, articular process that's shaped like a pulley and is often a component in joints. And a condyle is a smooth, rounded, articular process that is also often a component of joints. A trochanter is a large rough projection that serves again as a muscle attachment point. A facet is a small flat articular surface. Articular means touching another bone to form a type of joint. A crest is a prominent ridge. A line is a low ridge more delicate than a crest. A spine is a pointed or narrow process. A ramus is an extension of a bone that makes an angle with the rest of the structure. The canal or meatus is a large passageway through a bone for things like blood vessels and nerves. And a sinus is a chamber within a bone often filled with air and or mucus. It serves to lighten the bone and also at the same time it allows the bone frequently to retain its strength. A foramen is a small rounded passageway for blood vessels or nerves to pass through a bone. A fissure is an elongated cleft or gap. A sulcus is a deep, narrow groove. So sulci are um, usually uh, not quite as deep as fissures are. Okay? Fissure would be a significant split in the surface of a bone. A sulcus would be a, a, a more shallow split within the surface of a bone. A fossa is a shallow depression or a recess in the surface of a bone, and it also often serves as a site for muscle attachment. So you can see some examples of these different bone markings here. Okay, So we can point out a few of these and indicate what their function is in some cases. So starting up top, Okay, we have the example of a canal or a meatus. Okay, you can see here in the skull there are grooves in the back of the eye socket. Okay, uh, and there are also holes in the back of the eye socket, and they serve as passageways for nerves that talk to structures in the eye socket, such as muscles that move the eyeball and the nerve that projects into the back of the eyeball that allows us to see, which is called the optic nerve. Okay, So meatus is basically how the optic nerve gets into the back of the eyeball. A sinus, you can see here, Okay, sinus shown here, a hollow area inside a bone that lightens the bone. The frontal sinus is the sinus indicated here, and its purpose is to allow the bone to be lighter it's also connected to the nasal cavity and it serves in phonation. It allows us to uh, make noise when we speak more loudly. And you can tell that it's, it's functional because if you hold your nose and try to talk, the quality of your voice changes dramatically. Foramen, okay, shown here. 
is a tiny little hole or pit, okay? Serves as a passageway for blood vessels. Um, down here you can see an example of a fissure, okay? Nerves that innervate the muscles that move the eyeball pass through that fissure in the back of the orbital cavity. And a process, of course, is a projection off the surface of the bone. Okay, That particular bone there is the zygomatic bone. Other features down here, these are the oscoxa, these bones here. That's one oscoxa, that's the other oscoxa. This guy here is the sacrum. Okay. There's an example of a crest, right? A mild ridge on the surface of a bone. The fossa right there, a deep indentation in the bone that serves as a muscle attachment site. There's a line, okay? That little tiny ridge there. A spine, right? This little projection here is an example of a spine. Ramus, right? something that projects from bone forming an angle so you've got a ramus there and you've got a ramus there okay. up here you can see the proximal head of the humerus tubercle is that little bump right there there is a greater and a lesser tubercle and an inner tubercular groove between them that serves as a passageway for the tendon of the biceps brachii sulcus shown here Intertubercular sulcus or groove can be used interchangeably. Tuberosity. This is the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. Serves as an attachment point for the deltoid muscle. The shaft is a diaphysis. The trochanter is a rounded projection that fits into a socket. This particular projection off the distal head of the humerus fits into a a groove that forms the elbow joint called the olecranon. Okay, allows you to bend your elbow. And then you can see condyles, a knuckle shaped pro smooth projection off the surface of the bone. Trochanter, right, is a, a very pronounced projection that serves as a muscle attachment point. You can see another head there, right, right there, the uh, proximal head of the femur, which articulates, incidentally, with the acetabulum of the oscoxa. The neck is this narrower portion underneath the head. In this case, the neck would be seen as distal to the head. There's the diaphysis. There's an example of a facet and a condyle. Okay, So, some features that we're going to become more familiar with later. Now we want to familiarize ourselves with long bone structure. Examples of long bones include the bone of your upper arm, the humerus, the bone of your thigh, the femur, the bones of your forearm, the radius and the ulna, the bones of your lower leg, the tibia and the fibula, just to name a few. The epiphyses are the expanded area at each end of the bone well, the diaphysis is the shaft, which is a long tubular portion of the bone. The wall is composed of a thick layer of compact bone. Articular cartilage covers parts of the epiphyses that articulate with other bones. It's generally a vascular tissue, meaning that it gets its nutrients primarily by diffusion of a fluid called synovial fluid through the extracellular matrix of the articular cartilage in order to nourish the cartilage cells called chondrocytes that live inside the matrix and are trapped there. It relies on this in order for nutrients to access the chondrocytes and for waste products to be eliminated. This is why it's important um, to move, right, because that allows the chondrocytes to remain viable longer and that keeps the cartilage healthier longer. The marrow cavity is a space within the shaft of a long bone. It's filled with bone marrow. Red bone marrow is involved in red blood cell production, while yellow bone marrow is adipose tissue and serves as an energy reserve. And again, um, in infants, the long bones frequently are filled with red marrow. As we age, 
the red marrow gets replaced by adipose tissue and is no longer hematopoietic, meaning it no longer is a source of red blood cell production. The epiphyses are composed mostly of spongy bone. They have a network of struts and plates that resembles a lattice. Spongy bone is covered with a thin layer of compact bone on the surface and this allows the bone to be lightweight but also strong because the struts distribute applied force across a greater area and as a result the bone is less likely to fracture. The periosteum is connective tissue that wraps around the superficial layer of compact bone. It isolates the bone from the surrounding tissue and plays a role in bone growth and repair. An extensive network of arteries and veins in the epiphyses in the shaft bring nutrients to the living bone. And bone is living tissue, make no doubt about it. It is a complex of calcium phosphate salts and a protein called collagen. So you can see here an example of each of these in bone. Um, they provide the ability of bone to resist both shear stress in the case of the collagen component of bone and compression force in the case of the calcium phosphate salt. So it's very similar to the way the concrete is poured. If you've ever seen a sidewalk poured, you don't just pour the concrete into a hole because it'll likely crack. You have a steel meshwork laid down first and you pour the concrete over it and the result is a double strong structure that lasts a lot longer. Collagen is one-third the weight of bone. It's strong and flexible and bends if it's compressed. The calcified matrix of calcium phosphate is the other two-thirds of the bone weight that's found in crystals that are hard, inflexible, and brittle. A combination of collagen and calcified crystals make the bone strong, flexible, and resistant to shattering. And incidentally, in the inset there, you're, you're looking at a kind of a mini science experiment that you can do at home. Um, this is a little, looks like a chicken bone. And what they've done is they've taken the chicken bone and they've soaked it in uh, cider vinegar for several days and this dissolves the calcium phosphate salts leaving behind only the collagen and when you extract the bone from the vinegar it's uh, bendable and flexible like a rubber band so you can see here how the the bone bends and twists you can do that for instance with a wishbone if you like the next time you get a bucket of chicken there are three types of bone cells these are osteocytes osteoblasts and osteoclasts um, the osteocytes are <laughs> essentially what osteoblasts become once they get trapped in their own matrix. The osteoclasts dissolve bony matrix and the osteoblasts deposit it. So they all act together to remodel bone as force is applied so that the bone becomes densest in areas where the force is applied. Osteocytes are mature bone cells that maintain the matrix. They secrete chemicals that dissolve it. Rebuilding of the matrix stimulates deposition of mineral crystals. The matrix is formed in layers that are called lamellae. The osteocytes live in lacunae. The process of osteocytes extend into canaliculi, and they play a role in bone repair. They cannot divide, and what happens, essentially, is that they begin life as these cells, the osteoblasts, okay, and they slowly deposit matrix all around them and eventually become trapped in these lacunae. In order to, for them to get nutrients and remove waste products, the canaliculi serve as connections through compact and spongy bone that allow the osteocytes to communicate with each other and exchange nutrients and waste products until we get to bone cells that are near a blood supply at which point they can directly pick up the fuel from the blood and or dump waste products into it. Okay, so it's a pretty clever arrangement. I often say that um, what happens to osteocytes is the same thing that happens when uh, somebody that's not too bright paints a floor, right? What's the dumb way to paint a floor? To start at the door that opens into the room and paint yourself all the way into a corner and then you can't leave the room until the paint dries. Well, the same thing happens to osteocytes and chondrocytes. They deposit matrix all around themselves until 
they're trapped inside their own matrix and the result then is they have to have some other way of getting nutrients. In the case of the chondrocytes it's through diffusion. In the case of the osteocytes it's by holding hands with their neighboring osteocytes. Osteoblasts produce new bone matrix in a process called ossification. They make and release proteins and other organic components of the matrix. The osteocytes develop from osteoblasts and are surrounded by matrix. The osteoclasts are giant multinucleate cells that are derived from the same stem cells as monocytes and macrophages. They remove and recycle the bone matrix and secrete acids and proteolytic enzymes to dissolve the matrix and release stored minerals. So they act as a team, the osteoclast and the osteoblast, constantly remodeling bone. The process is called osteolysis. Okay? So they do this through the action of lysosomes that contain powerful enzymes that can acidify and dissolve this mineralized matrix in order to um, again allow the bone to adjust to applied force. It makes sense, right, that the bone should be densest in the area that is is subject to the greatest force, otherwise the bone is more likely to shatter. Remember that the osteocytes don't just sit inside the matrix doing nothing, they do help to maintain the matrix, okay? They secrete chemicals that dissolve it and they also rebuild it um, even though they're trapped inside their own secretions. This is what the cells look like. You see the osteocytes here in compact bone trapped inside the lacunae, okay? And the canaliculi allow the cytoplasmic extensions of the osteocytes to reach across the calcified matrix and make contact with neighboring osteocytes in order to exchange nutrients and waste products, oxygen and carbon dioxide. There are the osteoclasts. You can see here the multinucleate cells dissolving bone matrix. And then you can see here how compact and spongy bone are related to each other, right? The compact bone sits at the periphery and the spongy bone is deeper inside and that again allows strength but also reduces the overall weight so that the skeletal system is more functional. You can see here the osteoblasts and the uncalcified matrix here and eventually that's going to become calcified as the osteoblasts continue to deposit the salts that make up the mineralized portion of bone. You can see here an actual slide of compact bone. Compact bone is unique. It's made up of functional units called osteons. They're the basic functional unit of mature compact bone. They have a central canal that contains arteries and veins. The matrix is formed in concentric rings around the central canal. And what you're looking at here, right, central canal, you can see the osteocytes in the lacunae. Those are those little dark areas here, okay? And the whole thing is an osteon. These little rings of, of matrix are called lamellae. And since they, have, uh, they share a center, they're called concentric lamellae. So there's a concentric lamellae there, there's a concentric lamellae there, and on outward towards the periphery, okay? Note the canaliculi as well. You can see them throughout the lamellae. Calcium has to main, be maintained within a certain limit inside the blood supply. We can't let calcium concentration get too high or too low. Otherwise, um, in the event that we get it too high, we have the potential for forming calcium crystals that can contribute to conditions like kidney stones. If we let it get too low, we're going to compromise um, nerve and muscle function um, and we're also going to have problems initiating and maintaining blood clotting. Okay, So we have to keep calcium within a nice window. There's rarely more than a 10 percent fluctuation in calcium concentration in the blood. The regulation involves the skeleton. The osteoclasts usually erode the matrix and release calcium into the bloodstream. 
the osteoblasts use the calcium to deposit new matrix. The intestines will absorb calcium and phosphate from your diet and that will enter the bloodstream. And the kidneys have varying levels of calcium phosphate that it can excrete in the urine, depending again on the body's need to either retain or to eliminate calcium. And there are important hormones that play a role in this as well. Uh, an example of a couple of hormones that are critical in calcium balance that we should just mention in passing. We'll do these in, uh, I don't know, magenta. Uh, one is parathyroid hormone. And the other is calcitonin. Other hormones that play a role include estrogen, testosterone, aldosterone. Okay. Okay. Compact bone consists of osteons that are parallel to the long axis of the bone, which are composed of concentric lamellae that have matrix with a central canal in the middle. Spongy bone is deep to the compact bone and is a network of struts and plates called trabeculae with no capillaries or venules in the matrix, and it tends to be lighter than compact bone. And you can see here that the lamellae come in different flavors as well. The lamellae that surround the central canals are called concentric lamellae. The lamellae between the uh, osteons are called interstitial lamellae and then these guys that go all the way around the outside of the bone are called circumferential lamellae. Okay? And then the spongy bone of course is deep to it. And you can also see here how the central canals and the perforating canals bring blood to every square inch of bone. Appositional growth is a description of bone that enlarges in thickness at the outer surface. Cells in the inner layer of the periosteum differentiate into osteoblasts. Bone matrix is added to the surface. The osteoblasts get trapped between the new lamellae and become osteocytes, which are not dead, they're still alive and maintaining the matrix, but they can't move anymore. Collagen fibers from tendons, ligaments, joint capsules get cemented into the lamellae as perforating fibers. And so you can see here um, an example of what this looks like. There's our, there's our bone in its original dimensions. There are the additional lamellae, the periosteum on the outside, and you can see the perforating fibers here. Okay, So this is one of the reasons why the connection between tendons and ligaments and bone is so intimate and difficult to, to rupture or to evolve. Usually, if you're going to injure a tendon or ligament, you'll likely tear the tendon or ligament before you tear it from the bone. In the event that you tear it from the bone, the bone's going to be um, tremendously damaged. Okay. The endiosteum is an incomplete cell layer that lines the marrow cavity. It's active in bone growth, repair, and remodeling, and covers the trabeculae of spongy bone, and it lines the inner surface of the central canal. Exposed sites of matrix are where osteoclasts and osteoblasts act, and you can see here again the entire system, right? So there's the endiosteum. Again, we're looking here deep inside the bone. You can see the osteoclast, the lamellae, the osteocytes trapped in the matrix, and you can also see here uh, the endiosteum, which is the birthplace of new osteoblasts. Okay, so very important that we understand um, where these cells come from, right? You see stem cells here and endiosteum lining the entire inner area of the cavity.
Bone formation, also known as osteogenesis or ossification, is the process by which bone tissue replaces embryonic connective tissue to form the skeleton. From childhood to early adulthood, ossification lengthens and thickens bone. In addition, the process of ossification is used throughout life to remodel bones. There are two methods of prenatal bone formation. During intramembranous ossification, bone is generated on or within fibrous connective tissue membranes. As the process begins, mesenchymal cells differentiate into osteoblasts in regions called ossification centers. The osteoblasts secrete osteoid or uncalcified bone matrix. Over a few days, osteoblasts become osteocytes and calcium and other mineral salts are laid down, hardening the matrix. The bone matrix develops thin columns of bone called trabeculae, which fuse to form spongy bone. Blood and lymphatic vessels grow into the surfaces of the newly formed bone and develop red bone marrow. Outside of the bone, a dense layer of connective tissue called the periosteum forms. Most outer layers of spongy bone are eventually replaced by compact bone, but the center remains spongy. Intramembranous ossification also occurs with skull bones in childhood. At birth, skull bones are separated by fontanelles, or soft spots, and sutures, immovable joints made of fibrous tissue. Fontanelles in the fetal skull allow for easier passage through the birth canal and rapid brain development. Up until adolescence, the fontanelles slowly ossify into sutures, providing the brain with greater protection. Endochondral ossification, the replacement of cartilage by bone, occurs in most bones of the skeleton. The process begins when embryonic mesenchyme condenses, forming the cartilage model, the shape of the future bone. The model grows within the fetus. Lengthwise growth is attained via interstitial growth. Width is attained via appositional growth. A nutrient artery penetrates the perichondrium, increasing nutrient availability to the cells. Osteogenic cells are stimulated to differentiate into osteoblasts. These cells secrete matrix beneath the perichondrium that forms a thin shell of compact bone known as the bone collar. As the perichondrium begins to form bone, it is now called the periosteum. The bone collar reduces diffusion to the cartilage inside the model, depriving it of nutrients. Capillaries grow into the disintegrating cartilage, delivering osteoblasts. The new growth forms a primary ossification center, an area where bone tissue will replace most of the cartilage. Osteoblasts deposit bone matrix building spongy bone trabeculae. The growing model is gradually remodeled. The cavity fills with capillaries and red bone marrow. Ossification proceeds forming the main portion of a bone known as the diaphysis. Around the time of birth, blood vessels enter the epiphyses, the ends of a bone, forming secondary ossification centers. Secondary ossification differs in that no medullary cavity forms, and ossification proceeds outward.
As a result, the interior of the epiphysis remains spongy. Secondary ossification leaves a thin layer of hyaline cartilage covering the epiphyses. This is known as articular cartilage, and it reduces the friction and shock in bone joints. The change to the epiphysis also forms the epiphyseal plate, a layer of hyaline cartilage that enables the diaphysis to grow in length. The epiphyseal line is an area of longitudinal growth that persists until the end of puberty. The growth spurt at puberty is in response to sex hormone and growth hormone and thyroid hormone. Osteoblasts produce bone faster than chondrocytes produce epiphyseal cartilage. Epiphyseal cartilage thins and disappears. The former location seen on x-rays is known as the epiphyseal line and once that forms, longitudinal growth is no longer possible. Some atypical skeletal growth patterns include pituitary growth failure, where inadequate growth hormone is generated. We see reduced epiphyseal cartilage activity and abnormally short bones. It's rare in the U.S. Children are usually treated with synthetic growth hormone until they reach normal adult height at the end of puberty. Achondroplasia is a genetic disorder where the epiphyseal cartilage of long bones grows very slowly. We result in short stocky limbs and a normal sized trunk. Marfan syndrome is an inherited metabolic disorder where we have excessive cartilage formation at epiphyseal cartilages. This results in very tall individuals with long slender limbs. It affects other connective tissue throughout the body as well. Often in individuals with Marfan's we have joints that tend to dislocate relatively easily. We call those luxations. Gigantism is the result frequently of overproduction of growth hormone prior to the end of puberty. It can produce heights in excess of eight feet. Puberty is often delayed in these cases. Acromegaly is a similar condition where the production of growth hormone persists after the end of puberty. Once the epiphyseal cartilage is closed, the only bone growth possible is in the appositional direction. The bones get thicker but not longer, especially in the face, the jaws, and the hands. Ectopic bones form in areas where bone isn't normally expected to be found. This happens where stem cells in any connective tissue develop into osteoblasts. Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva is a single gene mutation that causes the deposition of bone around skeletal muscle. And there is no effective treatment, again, because this is an inherited disorder. Okay, here's a little video on fracture and repair and on basic fractures. The skeletal system is made up of 206 bones and provides support, allows for movement, and protects the internal organs of the body. Sometimes too much pressure is applied to a bone that results in what is known as a fracture. We zoom from this cross-section of fractured bone to a close-up view of the outer surface of the bone. After fracture, blood vessels in the bone and in the surrounding soft tissues tear and bleed into the fracture line and form a hematoma. Necrotic bone tissue adjacent to the fracture releases messengers that cause an intense inflammatory response, exudation and migration of macrophages, monocytes, lymphocytes and fibroblasts to the fracture site. This is known as the inflammatory phase. Fibroblasts lay down a fibrin stroma or meshwork in the hematoma, allowing and aiding the development of new capillary penetration and granulation tissue, while phagocytes begin to ingest cell debris as part of the fracture line cleanup. Chondroblasts start to lay down a cartilaginous matrix, 
and osteoblasts migrate to both edges of the fracture line and produce collagen fibers that eventually connect across the fracture. An osteoid is secreted along the cartilaginous matrix and then start to mineralize, forming a soft callus. This is known as the repair phase. Osteoblasts continue to proliferate and produce collagen fibers and a spongy bone matrix which bridges the fracture line and fills the swelling at the edge of the fracture, forming a bony callus. Osteoclasts then migrate into the repair site and start to dissolve and remove excess bone from the callus. In response to mechanical and electrical forces, osteoclasts and osteoblasts in concert remodel the callus so that the edges of the callus line up with the original edges of the fractured bone. This is known as the remodeling phase. Sure. Fractures are often classified as either open or closed. An open fracture is a fracture where a piece of the broken bone pierces through the skin. This can be dangerous because the bone is exposed, increasing the risk of infection. A closed fracture is a fracture where the bone is broken but does not come through the skin. A compression fracture is a closed fracture that occurs when two or more bones are forced against each other. It commonly occurs to bones of the spine and may be caused by falling into a standing or sitting position or a result of advanced osteoporosis. An avulsion fracture is a closed fracture where a piece of bone is broken off by a sudden forceful contraction of a muscle. This type of fracture is common in young athletes and can occur when muscles are not properly stretched before activity. This fracture can also be a result of an injury. An impacted fracture is similar to a compression fracture, yet it occurs within the same bone. It is a closed fracture that occurs when pressure is applied to both ends of the bone, causing it to split into two fragments that jam into each other. This type of fracture is common in falls and car accidents. All fractures must be taken seriously. If you think that a bone has been fractured, you should seek immediate medical attention. Some types of fractures are shown here, transverse, across the long axis of the bone, spiral fractures, a twisting break in the bone, a displaced fracture where the ends of the bones are no longer in close proximity, and this can result in either an open or a closed fracture. In the event of an open fracture, the bone protrudes through the skin and the risk of infection is quite high. In the case of a closed fracture, the soft tissue remains intact. In any of these cases, we have to set the ends of the bones so that they grow together in their normal position, and this is called reduction of the fraction. Compression fracture shown here. Green stick fracture. Okay, This is frequently seen in children who have a higher collagen content in their bone and so you're more likely to break the bone on one side as opposed to completely shatter it when you apply undue force. Common unit fracture where we have fragments of bone, epiphyseal fracture which is a break at the epiphyseal plate, a POTS fracture you can see here which is essentially uh, taking place here between the carpals and the radius and the ulna and uh, we're shearing off essentially the the distal head of the bone and a Coles fracture pictured here. The axial skeleton includes the bones of the skull and associated bones including the thoracic cage and the vertebral column and forms the long axis of the body. It supports and protects the brain and spinal cord and provides attachment surfaces for muscles that adjust the position of the head, neck, and trunk and perform respiratory movement and stabilize parts of the appendicular skeleton that support the limbs. The appendicular skeleton includes the bones of the limbs and supporting girdles that connect the limbs to the trunk. The facial bones 
protect and support the entrance to the GI and respiratory tract, and provide areas for attachment of muscles controlling facial expression and assisting in eating and speech. Here you see an anterior view of the skull and the facial bones. Facial bones include the nasal bones, which support the superior portion of the bridge of the nose, the lacrimal bones, which form parts of the medial walls of the orbit. Okay, you can see those here and here, and they contain the lacrimal ducts, which allow tears to drain as they flow across the eyes and into the nasal cavity. The palatine bones that form the posterior portion of the hard palate and part of the floor of the orbit. The zygomatic bones, which form part of the cheekbone and part of the lateral wall of the orbit. The maxillae, which support the upper teeth and form the inferior orbital rim, the upper jaw, and most of the hard palate. The inferior nasal conchi, which increase turbulence of air in the nasal cavity so that it comes into greater contact with the mucous membranes and is more effectively filtered, warmed, and humidified so that it doesn't damage lung tissue once it reaches the delicate squamous epithelia of the lungs. The vomer, which forms the inferior portion of the bony nasal septum, and the mandible that forms the lower jaw. The cranial bones form the cranium, which protects your brain. Blood vessels, nerves, and membranes attach to the inner surface. The outer surface attachment point includes muscles that move the eyes, the jaws, and the head. The frontal bone forms the anterior portion of the cranium and the roof of the orbits and contains the frontal sinuses. The sphenoid bone is known as the keystone of the cranium because all the other cranial bones come into contact with it. It forms part of the floor of the cranium and is a cross brace that strengthens the sides of the skull. The ethmoid forms the anterior medial floor of the cranium, the roof of the nasal cavity, part of the nasal septum, and the medial orbital wall. Okay, so you can see the ethmoid here, uh, if you look very carefully, in green. It's an unusual bone. Um, the superior and middle nasal conchi are lateral features. The perpendicular plate is dead center and then sitting atop the ethmoid bone inside the cranium are the crystagalli where the dural folds that surround the brain attach at anterior midline and the perpendicular plate um, I'm sorry the uh, the cribriform plate which comes out at a right angle and it sits atop the nasal cavity, it has holes in it, and this allows the neurons of the olfactory bulb to send extensions into the nasal cavity so that we have a sense of smell. Okay, so it's a, a very unusual looking bone. It sits right behind the nasal bone and right in front of the sphenoid bone. Incidentally, uh, a way to kind of keep these bones in your head the oid bones are going to be the internal bones, the ones that aren't easily seen from the surface, from the outer surface, and the bones that end in all, okay, like frontal, parietal, occipital, are the bones that are going to be on the external portion of the cranium. Cranial bones of the posterior skull include the parietal bones, which form part of the superior and lateral surface of the cranium. The occipital bone that contributes to the posterior, lateral, and inferior cranial surface. The external occipital crest, which is an attachment point for a ligament that helps stabilize the vertebrae of the neck. The temporal bones that form part of the lateral wall of the cranium. They articulate with the mandible and the facial bones. Um, they also contain uh, passageways for the eighth cranial nerve that comes into contact with the cochlea, which is the organ of hearing, and the vestibular apparatus and semicircular canals, which are the inner ear organs that help us maintain our balance. They surround the sense organs of the inner ear and protect it, and they also provide an attachment site for muscles that close the jaw and move the head. Sutures are examples of joints that do not move, so they are functionally classified as synarthroses, 
These are connections between the skull bones that we find in adults and they're held together by dense fibrous connective tissue. The immovable joints do not permit much movement, if any, and as a result they're less likely to become injured or dislocated. The coronal suture attaches the frontal bone to the parietal bones. The sagittal suture attaches the parietal bones to each other. The squamous suture attaches the temporal bones to the parietal bones. And the lamboidal suture attaches the occipital bone to the parietal bone. Now, I want you to think about why these bones have, why these sutures have the names that they do. And we can real quick kind of outline this for you. Um, the lamboidal suture here, okay, this guy, which goes, you know, across here and over here, gets its name because when viewed in juxtaposition with the sagittal suture, which is here, it looks like the Greek letter lambda, okay, so that's where the name comes from. The sagittal suture here is so named because it divides the skull into a right and left half, so it cuts a sagittal plane through the skull. The coronal suture is not visible from the posterior aspect, we'll see it in the next slide, but it divides the skull into a front and back half. Okay, so that's where the names come, come from. Squamosal suture down here. I don't really have a good explanation for where that name comes from. Squamosal um, generally means flat, so you could think of this as the flattest of all the sutures, I guess, as a way to kind of keep it in your head. But again, it separates the temporal bones from the parietal bone. Here you can see what it looks like in uh, lateral view. Surface features of the skull that you can see here include the frontal squama, which is the forehead. It forms the anterior superior portion of the cranium. Superior and inferior temporal lines are also visible. Um, you can see the, uh, the temporal lines if you look very carefully. Um, superior and inferior temporal. Let me give you a view here. Blue. Okay. So you can you can see them sort of here, okay, here. These are low ridges and attachment points for the temporalis muscle. It helps you chew. The squamous part of the temporal bone is convex. It has an irregular surface that borders the squamosal suture. That's the squamosal suture right there, okay, you can see it. The external acoustic meatus is a major feature. Uh, this is how the eighth cranial nerve comes into contact with the cochlea and with the vestibular apparatus. The canal on the lateral surface ends at the tympanic membrane, which we commonly call the eardrum. On the skull, the mastoid process, this little round area right here, is an attachment site for muscles that rotate or tilt the head. The condylar process articulates with the temporal bone. So you can see here the condylar process of the mandible, which articulates right here uh, in this little uh, fossa. Okay? It forms the only movable bone or movable joint in the skull, which is the articulation between the mandible and the temporal bone. Okay? The styloid process is attached to several tendons and ligaments that support the hyoid bone. The coronoid process is an insertion point for the temporalis muscle. The zygomatic process is uh, found on the temporal bone and it articulates with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to form the zygomatic arch, which is your, is your cheek. Okay? The mental protuberance is an attachment site for the facial muscles while the alveolar processes support the upper and the lower teeth. Okay, so you can see all that information there. Okay. Alright. 
This is the underside of the skull with the mandible removed. The mandibular fossa is the site of articulation with the mandible. Okay, so the condylar process of the mandible articulates with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone to form the joint between your lower jaw and your skull. The occipital condyles are sites of articulation between the skull and the first vertebra. There are several holes that we need to be aware of. The foramen ovale is a passage for nerves that innervate the jaws. The carotid canal is a passage for the internal carotid artery that heads up to the brain. The jugular foramen is a passage for the internal jugular vein. And the foramen magnum surrounds the connection between the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so this is where the brain and the spinal cord meet up. Foramen magnum literally means big hole. Okay, so you see the jugular foramina, the carotid canals. Okay, and you can also see the foramen ovale. There are two other holes, the spinosum um, and the rotundum that radiate across the surface of the sphenoid bone and they serve as passageways for branches of the trigeminal nerve which innervate structures in the face. This is the floor of the skull. Landmarks that you can see here include the crystal galley which is a ridge protecting superior to the cribiform plate which you can see here and here. Okay. It's an attachment point for the Falk cerebrae, which is a membrane that stabilizes the position of the brain. The cribiform plate contains olfactory foramina, which are passages for olfactory nerves. The cella tersica is this saddle-shaped region here, which encloses the pituitary gland. The internal acoustic meatus carries blood vessels and nerves to the inner ear, and if you follow it all the way through to the outside of the skull, you'll see the external acoustic meatus. So it's one long tunnel straight through the temporal bone. Okay, So that's ethmoid. That's frontal. Okay, This is sphenoid, keystone of the cranium, temporal, occipital here, Okay, and a little bit of parietal over here. The paranasal sinuses are air-filled chambers that are connected to the nasal cavities and they lighten the skull bones. They provide extensive areas of mucous epithelium so that when you breathe in, the air is humidified, warmed, and filtered. The frontal sinuses are variable in size and time of appearance. The ethmoidal air cells are a network of small chambers. Mucus from here flushes the surface of the nasal cavities. The sphenoidal sinus is a hollow chamber inside the sphenoid bone, while the maxillary sinuses are the largest sinuses. Mucus from here flushes the inferior surface of the nasal cavity. This is one of the reasons why when you have a sinus infection, you feel tremendous pressure around your eyes. You feel like your eyes are going to pop out of your head. Okay? So they're all connected to the nasal cavity. Okay. The sphenoidal sinuses are on the sides of the sphenoidal body. They vary in size and they're inferior to the cella tersica. The ethmoid bone contains the central plate which contributes to the nasal septum. We sometimes call that the perpendicular plate. The superior nasal conchi on the lateral margins of the ethmoid bone project into the nasal cavity as do the middle nasal conchi. The inferior nasal conchi are their own bone. Okay, so that's a separate little tiny bone in the skull. They also protect the nasal cavity on either side of the nasal septum. There are also orbital plates of the ethmoid that form the medial walls of the orbit where your eyeballs sit. Okay, so this is again basically looking at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The hyoid bone is unusual in that it's the only bone in the body that does not articulate with any other bone, and it's an attachment for neck and tongue muscles. The greater horns help support the larynx and are attached to muscles that move the tongue. The lesser horns are attached to ligaments that suspend the hyoid and larynx. 
The body of the hyoid is an attachment site for muscles of the larynx, tongue, and pharynx. The auditory ossicles are enclosed in the temporal bone and are important in conducting vibrations to the inner ear. And these are the smallest bones in the body. They almost don't look real. They're so very tiny. Okay, So you can see here, again, the facial bones numbered, the cranial bones numbered, and other associated bones such as the hyoid and the auditory ossicles. Okay? Now, um, another point of order while we're here, notice that some of the bones come in right and left, okay, and some of the bones do not have a right and left. So we call those paired and unpaired bones. If it's a bone that has a right and a left, it's a paired bone. If it's a bone that does not have a right and a left, it is an unpaired bone. For instance, the frontal bone is unpaired, the temporal bones are paired. Okay. Okay, this is a look at the skull of a newborn. And you'll see an unusual feature here, not, not present in the adult skull, which are fontanelles. These permit cranial growth in infants and small children. They're flexible, fibrous connective tissue that connects the cranial bones at birth and allow the skull shape to distort during birth. The anterior fontanelle is what we know as the soft spot and persists until nearly two years of age while the occipital fontanelle is a junction between the lamboid and the sagittal suture and disappears within a month or two after birth. The sphenoidal fontanelle is on each side between the squamous and coronal sutures and the mastoid fontanelle is on each side between the squamous and the lamboidal sutures. Essentially this is connective tissue and it allows for the, the bones to eventually knit and form the sutures Sometimes children are born with an excess of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain that is the result of an impingement of the flow of cerebrospinal fluid back to the circulatory system. And the increased intracranial pressure can cause the cranial vault to expand, and we call this condition hydrocephaly. We'll write that up here. Hydrocephaly. It's commonly known as water on the brain. And due to the presence of the fontanelles, this does not usually result in extensive damage to the brain because of the ability of the cranial vault to expand and relieve the pressure. Generally, the treatment for this condition is to put in a shunt that allows the excess cerebrospinal fluid to drain into the abdominal pelvic cavity. This shunt is entirely inside the body of the infant. The pressure is relieved and eventually the cranial vault can assume its normal dimensions. In an adult, if this happens, due to the fact that the flat bones of the skull have sealed with sutures, the increase in intracranial pressure can result in extensive neuronal damage and can lead to coma and death. This is one of the reasons why we worry a lot about bleeding into the brain, such as when you have, a, in some cases, a stroke or um, if you have a concussion, and that can produce the same kind of effect. The vertebral column is made up of 26 bones, 24 vertebrae, and the sacrum, as well as the coccyx. It averages about 28 inches and provides a column of support that transfers the body weight to the lower limbs and protects the spinal cord while maintaining our upright posture. Primary curves develop before birth and secondary curves develop after birth. The cervical curvature is the secondary curvature that develops as the infant learns to balance the weight of the head on the neck, while the thoracic curvature is the primary curvature and accommodates the thoracic organs. Okay, so you can see those here, okay, thoracic curvature, cervical curvature. So it has kind of an S shape to it. Okay. 
The lumbar curvature is secondary and develops with the ability to stand. It allows us to balance the weight of our trunk over our lower limbs. There are several vertical, vertebral divisions. The cervical has seven vertebrae running C1 through C7. The thoracic has 12 from T1 to T12. The lumbar with five. The sacral having only the sacrum. And the coccygeal having the coccyx, which at one time was our tailbone. Okay. Notice that the vertebral column gets bigger as you go from the head down towards the hips. And the reason for that is it supports more weight. The sacral curvature is primary and it accommodates the abdominal pelvic organs. Okay? So when we say primary, what we mean is it exists at birth. When we say secondary, it forms after birth as a result of a change in the distribution of weight. So what you're looking at here are some regional differences in vertebral structure and function. Okay, I won't go through each one of these, just make sure and review this in the textbook. This is an important way for you to distinguish the different types of vertebrae from each other. Let's look at the basic parts of a vertebra. It has three basic parts. The articular process, which extends superiorly and inferiorly to articulate with adjacent vertebrae. The vertebral arch, which forms the posterior and lateral margins of the vertebral foramen and the vertebral body, which transfers the weight along the axis of the vertebral column. You can see that down here in purple. The spinous process is this projection that extends posteriorly and inferiorly from anatomical position. It projects from where the laminae fuse. The laminae form the roof of the vertebral foramen the vertebral foramen is framed by the vertebral body and the vertebral arch and the spinal cord sits right inside right here. The transverse processes project laterally on both sides and are sites of muscle attachment while the pedicles form the sides of the vertebral arch and they abut the body. Okay, So you can see here again the pedicles and the lamina. Okay, All parts of the vertebral arch. The vertebral canal covers the spinal cord, which is about the width of your little finger. It's formed by the vertebral foramina of successive vertebrae. The bodies of adjacent vertebrae are connected by ligaments. Adjacent vertebrae are separated by intervertebral discs, which are pads of fibrocartilage. Spaces between successive pedicles form the intervertebral foramina, which provide passageways for nerves and blood vessels. Very important that these passageways remain in their normal conformation. If they are impinged upon as a result of changes in spinal curvature, such as scoliosis, for instance, you can mash down on spinal nerves and interfere with the nerve's ability to send commands to effector organs and as well as bring in afferent information to the spinal cord. The superior articular processes articulate with the inferior articular processes of more superior vertebrae. The inferior articular processes articulate with the superior articular processes of the more inferior vertebrae, or in case of the last lumbar vertebra, the sacrum. The articular facet is a smooth concave surface on each articular process and allows the vertebral column to move in and out and left and right to some degree with each articulation. The combined flexibility of all of these articulations allows a pretty substantial degree of freedom of movement along the entire vertebral column. Okay, that's why you can move your back in and out and left and right without uh, much difficulty. The cervical vertebrae are found in the neck. They're the smallest in the vertebral column. All seven have transverse foramina, which allow passages of vertebral arteries and veins. They have short, stumpy, transverse processes. C2 through C6 have biforked spinous processes at the posterior. See how they split in the back. 
C7 has a large spinous process ending in a tubercle, which is called the vertebra prominence, and marks the barrier between the cervical division and the thoracic division. You can feel it through the skin. If you run your hand down the back of your neck, and you get to that first bump, that's the vertebra prominence. An elastic ligament connects from here to the occipital bone. Here you can see the spinous process of C7. That's why it's called the vertebra prominence, because it is longer than the vertebra above it. The first two cervical vertebrae are special. They're called the atlas and the axis. The atlas has no vertebral body or spinous process. It's a large, round vertebral foramina that articulates with the occipital condyles and permits you to nod your head yes. The axis is a prominent vertical process called the dens, which is a superior projection on its body. The dens is bound to the atlas by a transverse ligament and it permits rotational movement such as when you shake your head no. Okay, So you can see here the atlas and underneath it the axis. Okay, The occipital condyles would rest here and here and the atlas is able to pivot across the axis when you shake your head no. Okay? And incidentally this would be the front this would be the back, just to orient you. Okay. All right. The thoracic vertebrae are below the cervical vertebrae. There's 12 of them. Each one is slightly larger as they move towards the feet. They have a heart-shaped body and a long, slender spinous process that projects posteriorly and inferiorly. The costal facets on the vertebral body are for rib articulation. So these are the only vertebrae that articulate laterally with some other bone. Incidentally, um, if you look at the back of a thoracic vertebrae, at this collection of transverse and spinous processes, um, it will resemble somewhat the face of a giraffe. So that's a relatively easy way to pick out a thoracic vertebrae from the other vertebrae in the other divisions. T1 through T10 also have costal facets on their transverse processes. Okay? You can see here an inferior and a superior costal facet and again these are points for articulation with the ribs. Okay? The lumbar vertebrae are the largest and thickest and they transmit the weight to the sacrum and to the, um, the oscoxing, okay, the bones of the pelvic girdle. They're thicker than the thoracic vertebrae. They have superior and inferior surfaces that are oval in shape, no costal facets, slender transverse processes, and a triangular vertebral foramen, and a very stumpy spinous process. Superior articular processes face medially in these vertebrae, and inferior articular processes face laterally. Okay, so you can see the inferior articular process and the superior articular process. Now, I'll give you another hint here. If you look at a lumbar vertebrae from the back, it looks very much like the face of a moose. Uh, that's another way you can tell the different vertebrae from the different divisions. Okay. You don't really see that view in this picture, but I can show you an example of it a little bit later. The sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae that begin fusing after puberty and are completely fused by age 25 to 30. They protect the reproductive, digestive, and urinary organs, and they attach the axial skeleton to the appendicular. The anterior surface is concave, while the posterior is convex. The base is the broad superior surface and the ala, or wings, extend on each side from the base. The apex is the narrow inferior portion. You can see down here, 
and it's just above the coccyx. The transverse lines are the former boundaries of the individual vertebrae, as you can see those here and here. Okay? So they began life as separate bones and then they fused. Other surface features of the sacrum include the sacral promontory, which is a landmark for labor and delivery. Okay? You see this little sort of U-shaped region here at the um, superior margin of the sacrum near the base. The sacral foramina are intervertebral foramina that open into these. The sacral canal is a passageway for nerves and for membranes, while the sacral tuberosity is an attachment site for the sacroiliac joint ligaments. The articular surface is the site of articulation with the hip bones forming the sacroiliac or SI joint. The lateral sacral crest represents fused transverse processes of the sacral vertebrae, while the median sacral crest is formed by the fused spinous processes of the sacral vertebrae. And it forms this ridge right here. Okay, So you can see the median crest, you can see the lateral crests. Again, remember that these were once separate bones. The sacral hiatus is the opening at the inferior end of the sacral canal, right down here. And the superior articular process articulates with the last lumbar vertebrae. The coccyx is three to five fused coccygeal vertebrae. They begin fusing around age 26. They were once your tail. So you had a tail at one time while you were inside your mother's womb that slowly reabsorbed and disappeared as you aged. The thoracic cage provides bony support to the walls of the thoracic cavity and protects the heart, the lungs, and the thymus, and it's composed of the thoracic vertebrae, the ribs, and the sternum. It's an attachment point for muscles that are involved in breathing and maintaining the position of the vertebral column as well as an attachment site for muscles that move the pectoral girdle and the upper limbs. You can see here the components, right? The sternum, the ribs, and of course the vertebral column. The ribs come in three types. The true ribs, which are the first seven, are connected to the sternum by individual costal cartilage while the false ribs, which are ribs 8 through 10, are connected to the sternum by shared costal cartilage. So you can see here the false ribs, here, here, here. The last two ribs are called floating or vertebral ribs because they don't connect to the sternum at all. Okay, So you got 12 in total on each side of the vertebral column. The sternum is made up of three parts the manubrium, which is a trapezoid-shaped superior portion of the bone that articulates with the clavicle and the first pair of ribs, the body, which articulates with rib pairs two through seven, and the xiphoid process, this little projection down here, which is attached to the inferior portion of the body. It's a major landmark for people that want to learn cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If you find the xiphoid process, you can use that with pressure applied to massage the heart in the event that the heart stops beating. Some abnormal spinal curvatures should be addressed at this point that are going to have an impact on the ability to properly breathe as well as the potential to damage nerve roots that issue from the spinal cord in the region of the abnormal curvature. So kyphosis is an exaggerated thoracic curvature that gives the back a rounded appearance. It's caused by osteoporosis with compression fractures on the anterior part of the vertebral body, hence the, the slouched appearance. Chronic contraction in muscles that insert on the vertebrae can contribute to this as well, as well as abnormal vertebral growth. And you can see, and again, an example of this here. 
it changes the dimensions of the thoracic cage and can have an impact on the ability to ventilate the lungs as a result of them not being able to expand to their fullest extent. Scoliosis is an abnormal lateral curvature of the spine. It's the most common distortion of the vertebral column. It's caused by developmental problems and damage to the vertebral bodies as well as muscular paralysis that affects one side of the back. You can also have uh, contributing factors such as having lower limbs of unequal length contribute to this condition. There are some instances in which it is idiopathic, so we don't know the cause. The treatment is bracing or surgery in severe cases. Lordosis is an anterior exaggeration of the lumbar curvature, which we call swayback. Causes of lordosis include pregnancy, abdominal obesity, and weakness in abdominal wall muscles. The pectoral girdle connects the upper limbs to the trunk. It consists of two S-shaped clavicles, you can see them here and here, that articulate with the manubrium via their blunt sternal end and via their lateral end to the acromial process of the scapula. The two broad flat scapulae form the rest of the pectoral girdle and the indentation known as the glenoid fossa serves as an articulation point for the proximal head of the humerus which forms the shoulder joint. Okay. The interesting thing about this joint is that it's one of the most mobile in the body and as a result it's one of the most easily injured. The functional classification for this joint would be a diarthrosis which provides the greatest degree of movement of any of the other functional classifications, the other two being synarthrotic joints, which are immovable, and amphiarthrotic joints, which are slightly movable. The scapula has an anterior surface of the body with a triangle formed by the superior border, the medial border, and the lateral border. The corners of a triangle are the superior and inferior angle, as well as the lateral angle, which is the location of the glenoid fossa which again is the socket inside which the humerus sits to form the shoulder joint. The subscapular fossa is a depression on the anterior surface which is in contact with the rib cage and as a result allows movement of the scapula across the posterior rib cage so that you can move the shoulders relatively easily. The posterior surface is convex with prominent ridges and depressions, including the scapular spine, which is a ridge that runs from the medial to the lateral margin of the scapula and marks the dividing line between the supraspinous and the infraspinous fossa on the posterior aspect of the bone. The sub supraspinous fossa is a depression on top of the scapular spine well, the infraspinous is the analogous depression underneath the scapular spine. And there are muscles that sit in these little pockets that are part of the rotator cuff, which are muscles that allow us to stabilize the position of the humerus while it moves so that it doesn't fall out of the shoulder joint. In addition, these muscles also have some role in moving the upper arm. So here you can see the scapula anterior view, posterior view, okay, subscapular fossa, acromium and corosoid process, glenoid fossa, and over here on the back, supraspinous, infraspinous fossa, scapular spine, acromium, okay, medial border, lateral border, superior border, okay, those are your shoulder blades. If we look at it the scapula in the lateral view, you can see the glenoid cavity that articulates with the humerus. The acromium is the posterior projection of the scapula that extends laterally and projects posteriorly and superior to the glenoid cavity. It's continuous with the scapular spine and it articulates with the clavicle. The corosoid process projects anterior and superior to the glenoid cavity and forms a bony support 
for the superior anterior portion of the shoulder joint. What you need to notice about this is that there's very little bony reinforcement of the socket in which the head of the humerus sits to form the shoulder joint. This is one of the reasons why it's so easily injured because the rest of the depression in which the humerus sits is made up mostly of connective tissue which can be torn as opposed to bone which is a type of connective tissue but it provides much more support for a ball and socket joint than the connective tissue that makes the shoulder joint provides. This is why you always hear about athletes such as baseball pitchers and boxers and football players having rotator cuff surgery due to the undue force applied to the soft connective tissue that forms most of the lip of this depression that forms a shoulder joint. Here you can see the bone of the upper arm known as the humerus. It articulates with the scapula at the proximal end and the ulna and radius at the distal end. Surface features include the head, which articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula, the greater tubercle, which is lateral and larger, and the lesser tubercle, which is medial and smaller. In between them, the intertubercular groove runs between the tubercles and is essentially the passageway for the tendon of the biceps brachii. The anatomical and surgical neck are typical fracture sites for this bone. The deltoid tuberosity is a rough elevation where the deltoid muscle attaches. The radial groove provides the path of the radial nerve. The distal humerus includes the medial and lateral epicondyles. The projections above the condyles are called epicondyles. The capitulum, which forms the lateral surface of the condyle and is an articulation point for the radius and the trochlea, which is a spool-shaped medial portion of the condyle that extends from the olecranon fossa to the coronoid fossa. And this is really a major part of the elbow joint. It's an articulation point for the U-shaped proximal head of the ulna, which is the medial bone in your forearm. Speaking of the forearm, the two bones that make it up are the radius and the ulna. The radius is on the thumb side of the forearm in anatomical position while the ulna is on the little finger side. The olecranon is found on the ulna and is the point of the elbow and projects into the olecranon fossa while the coronoid process projects into the coronoid fossa of the humerus on the anterior aspect. The trochlear notch articulates with the trochlea of the humerus, while the radial notch articulates with the head of the radius at the proximal radial ulnar joint. The ulnar head articulates with the radius to form a distal radial ulnar joint, while the styloid process is attached to the head. The radial surface features the radial head, which articulates with the capitulum of the humerus, the neck, which extends from the radial head to the radial tuberosity, the radial tuberosity, which is an attachment site for the biceps brachii, and the styloid process, which is at the distal end of the bone and articulates with the carpals of the wrist. There's an interosseous membrane that runs between these two bones, which is a fiber sheet connecting the shafts of the ulna and the radius. Okay, So you can see that connective tissue here and here. Okay. So this is posterior view, this is anterior view, okay? This would be your elbow joint right here, right? This would be where your wrist would be located. Okay. The carpus has eight carpal bones arranged in two rows. The proximal include the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquertrum, and the pisiform. Well, the distal includes the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. There are five metacarpal bones, which are the bones of the palm of the hand, and articulate with the distal carpal bones. They're identified by Roman numerals 1 through 5, starting on the lateral side. The phalanges articulate with the metacarpals. There are 14 on each hand, 3 for each finger, and 2 
for the thumb or the pollux. Now notice that the digits of the hand are numbered one through five with the thumb being number one. Okay, So this is digit one, then two, then three, then four, then five. So with regard to the phalanges, right, we have a distal, medial, and proximal phalanx in the fingers, and we have a distal and proximal phalanx only in the thumb, and also we'll find out later on in the big toe. Okay, So the, the hands and the toes are kind of analogous structures. Okay, Your big toe would be kind of like the thumb of your hand, and the rest of your toes would be like the rest of the digits. And so the toes of your feet have a distal, medial, and proximal phalanx uh, with the exception of the hallux, the big toe, just as the thumb has only a distal and proximal phalanx, whereas the rest of the digits have a distal, medial, and proximal phalanx. Your knuckles are formed here and here when you make a fist, okay? And you can see here the bones of the carpals, okay? The distal bones shown here and the proximal bones shown here. The pelvic girdle is made up of two hip bones called coxal bones. The hip bone is formed by the fusion of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. The pubic symphysis is a fibrocartilage pad that connects the right and left pubic bones. So you can see here the pubis the ischium, and the ilium. Okay, and there, of course, is the sacrum, and there is the sacroiliac joint. And this little socket here is called the acetabulum, which is an articulation point for the proximal head of the femur, which forms your hip joint. If we look at a lateral view of the os coxa, we can see the iliac spines, which are attachment sites for muscles and ligaments, the gluteal lines, which are attachment points for the large hip muscles. The greater sciatic notch, which is a passageway for the sciatic nerve. The iliac crest, which is a ridge for muscle attachment. The ischial spine, which is inferior to the greater sciatic notch. And the ischial tuberosity, which bears the body's weight when you're seated. The acetabulum is an articulation point for the femur, while the obturator foramen is closed by a sheet of collagen fibers bounded by the ischial ramus, the inferior pubic ramus, and the superior pubic ramus. Okay, so you can see all those different rami here. Okay, ramus, ramus, ramus. Okay, there's the obturator right there. There's the acetabulum, right? Gluteal lines. There's your iliac crest anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine, sciatic notch, okay, there's the greater sciatic notch, the lesser sciatic notch, the ischial spine, and the posterior superior and inferior iliac spine. And that's right where your the head of the femur would go to form the hip joint. Here you can see an anterior view showing you the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium, as well as the sacrum and coccyx. The pelvic girdle consists of two hip bones plus the sacrum and coccyx. They're held together by an extensive network of ligaments. The sacroiliac joint is the articulation between the sacrum and the ilium of the os coxa. The union between the axial and the appendicular skeleton is found here as well as this is where the femur articulates with the coxal bone to form the hip joint. We can divide the pelvis into what we call the true and the false pelvis if we look from the top down. Okay, So just to give you an idea, right? this is a view from the top down, this is the view from the bottom up, this is anterior, this is posterior, over here this is anterior, and this is posterior. So the false pelvis encloses the organs in the inferior portion of the abdominal cavity, while the true pelvis encloses the pelvic cavity. The pelvic brim is the bony margin of the true pelvis. The pelvic inlet is the opening enclosed by the pelvic brim. The pelvic outlet is the opening bounded by the coccyx, 
the ischial tuberosities, and the inferior border of the pubic symphysis. Okay, so you can see here the pelvic outlet. Okay, the pelvic outlet, and you can see here the pelvic inlet formed again by the true pelvis. There's the false pelvis, which goes from iliac crest to iliac crest. The male and female pelvis have different dimensions because they have different jobs to do. The female pelvis has to be wide enough to allow the baby to get through the birth canal. So if we compare the two, we find that the female pelvis is smoother and lighter with less prominent markings. It's adapted for childbearing and has an enlarged pelvic outlet. It has a broader pubic angle, greater than 100 degrees, and it features less curvature on the sacrum and the coccyx. It has a wider, more circular pelvic inlet with a broad, low pelvis, and the ilia project further laterally, but not as superiorly. Whereas the male has a heart-shaped pelvic uh, inlet and outlet, narrower overall, and obviously is not suited for childbearing. The angle between the pubic rami is also much smaller than in the female. Okay, so you can see here the distance between the ischial spines is much wider in the female than the male. This allows the baby passage to the birth canal. The femur is the longest and strongest bone in the body. It articulates with the hip bone and tibia. The major landmarks include the femoral head, which articulates with the pelvis at the acetabulum, the hip socket if you like. The neck joins the head to the shaft at about a 125 degree angle. The greater trochanter is larger and lateral, and the lesser trochanter is smaller and more medial. The intertrochanteric line marks the edge of the articular capsule. The gluteal tuberosity is an attachment site for the gluteus maximus muscle, while the linea aspera is an attachment site for the hip muscles. The distal femur contains the medial and lateral condyles that articulate with the tibia to form the knee joint. The patellar surface is also found on the distal aspect of the anterior femur. It's a smooth surface for the patella to glide over. The intercondylar fossa is the posterior surface of the femur between the condyles. You can see it back here. Okay. It's got to support a lot of weight. As a result, it's very long and powerful bone. The projections on it are pronounced because the muscles that attach to it are quite powerful as well. If we look at the lower leg, which you think of as the calf, we find two major bones. We find the tibia is the medial strut of the lower leg and the fibula being the lateral strut. The proximal end of the tibia is medial and lateral and has condyles on the medial and lateral aspect that articulate with the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. The intercondylar eminence is the ridge that separates the medial and lateral condyles. The fibula is just a lateral stabilizer. It does not articulate with the femur. It's a small slender bone. It does not participate in the knee joint. It does not bear weight, but it is an attachment site for muscles that move the foot and the toes. The tibia and fibula landmarks include the tibial tuberosity, which is a bump just under where the patella would be located and is an attachment point for the patellar ligament, the anterior crest which is a ridge along the anterior tibial surface and the medial malleolus which provides medial stability to the ankle. The fibula has a head that articulates with the tibia and includes a distal projection called the lateral malleolus that provides lateral stability to the ankle an interosseous membrane it can be found between the fibula and the tibia just as it is found between the radius and ulna. This helps stabilize the bone positions. It's also going to provide additional surface area for muscle attachment. Okay? So when you think about your ankle, right, the bumps on the medial and lateral side of your ankle 
are the medial and lateral malleolus respectively. So the lateral a feature of the fibula, the medial a feature of the tibia. Okay, and of course they articulate with the talus which is the smooth bone right on top of your foot. Okay, so this is where we get down to the, the end of the lower appendicular skeleton. The ankle and the foot contain tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. The ankle has seven tarsal bones. The calcaneus, which is the heel bone, which is attached to the Achilles tendon, which is attached to two muscles, the soleus and the gastrocnemius, that help you to point your toe and push off when you walk or run. The talus, which articulates with the tibia and the fibula. The navicular, the cuboid, the three cuneiform bones, which are the medial, the intermediate, and the lateral, the five metatarsal bones that articulate with the distal surfaces of the cuboid and the cuneiform, and they're identified by Roman numerals one through five, starting on the medial side with the big toe. The phalanges articulate with the metatarsals. There are 14 on each foot, two for the great toe, also known as the hallux, and three for each other toe. Okay, so again, you can see here how these guys work, right? The talus, the navicular, down there is the cuboid, there are the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms, the metatarsals, and of course the phalanges. Okay, notice again how the, the big toe is homologous to the thumb and the hand, while the rest of the toes are more like the rest of the fingers in the hand. Notice also that the trochlea of the talus is quite smooth whereas it's it's a bone that articulates inferiorly the calcaneus has a very rough surface so if you're trying to determine if you've got an articulated foot what's the top and the bottom of the foot that's one of the dead giveaways which is that the the heel bone is going to be on the bottom and it's going to be rougher in shape well, the talus is going to be smooth and it's going to be on the top. So an easy way to tell them apart. If you look at a lateral view, you can see several arches in the foot that are designed to, to, to distribute the weight and are stabilized by tendons and ligaments. The longitudinal arch is formed due to ligaments and tendons that connect the calcaneus to the distal part of the metatarsals. They allow for weight transfer depending on the position of the foot Differences in elasticity result in elevation of the medial plantar surface. The transverse arch is due to the degree of longitudinal curvature changing from the medial to the lateral border of the foot. And this again helps to support our body's weight. Some abnormal developmental processes that can be, um, can be observed in the formation of the feet include congenital talipes equinoveris, which is improper arch development in the foot. The common name is clubfoot, results in abnormal muscle development that distorts the growing bones and may involve one or both feet. It ranges from mild to severe. The longitudinal arch becomes exaggerated and the feet turn medially and invert. It affects about one in a thousand births, but it's more common in males. Is treated with casts and support and also may require surgery. Articulations are areas where bones come together and allow either no or some or quite a bit a degree of movement. The amount of movement is determined by the anatomical structure. Joints can be functionally categorized as synarthroses which allow no movement amphiarthroses which provide little movement and diarthroses which are freely movable. Synarthroses are functionally immobile. The bones close together or interlock. Examples include sutures which are fibrous connections with interlocking surfaces. Gomphoses which are fibrous connections that insert into bony sockets. Those are where your teeth articulate with your jaw. Synchondroses, which are cartilaginous connections between two bones. Amphiarthroses, which permit more movement than synarthroses and are stronger than a freely movable joint. 
The bones here are connected by collagen fibers or cartilage. Fibrous amphiarthroses include syndesmoses, which are bones connected by ligaments, and you can see that in the radius and ulna and the tibia and the fibula. Cartilaginous amphiarthroses include symphyses, such as the pubic symphysis between the pubis of the right and left coxal bones. This is a fibrocartilage pad. And a diarthrotic joint is one that provides free movement, contains a joint capsule filled with synovial fluid, and as a result allows the greatest potential not only for motion, but also for injury. Okay. So here are some examples of different types of joints based on their functional and structural category. Again, the synarthrotic joints are the fibrous, the gonfotic, and the cartilaginous. The amphiarthrotic joints include the fibrous syndesmoses between the tibia and fibula, the cartilaginous symphyses between the pubi of the coxal bones. Diarthrotic joints are a different animal altogether. They feature a joint cavity with synovial fluid, articular cartilage at the ends of the articulating bones, and ligaments and tendons to stabilize the position of the joint and obviously contribute to the joint's movement. Okay. So here we can see some examples of a diarthrotic joint. You see the joint capsule, the synovial fluid, and articular cartilage pictured here, along with the synovial membrane which produces the synovial fluid, which is continuous with the periosteum of the bone. This allows free movement. The articular cartilages line ends up of each bone to each other. There is no perichondrium in these regions. The matrix has more water than other cartilage. The joint capsule is dense and fibrous and is often reinforced with tendons and ligaments, while the synovial fluid lubricates cushions and prevents abrasion and supports chondrocyte metabolic activity. It's produced by the synovial membrane that lines the joint cavity. The cells that produce the synovial fluid are called synoviocytes. What does synovial fluid do? Well, it's a lubricator. Okay? During compression of the joint, the synovial fluid is squeezed into the space between the opposing surfaces. The thin layer of fluid reduces friction between the surfaces. It also aids in nutrient distribution. Articular cartilage compresses and re-expands without movement and pumps synovial fluid into and out of the cartilaginous matrix. The circulating fluid provides nutrient and waste disposal. It's also a shock absorber. As the joint is compressed, synovial fluid distributes force evenly across the articular surfaces and outward to the joint capsule. And here you can see an example of a typical diarthrotic joint. This is the knee joint, the articulation between the femur and the tibia. Okay. So what are some of the interesting structures we see here? Well, we see a joint capsule, we see uh, articular cartilage, we see synovial fluid, obviously. We also see intra and extracapsular ligaments that stabilize the position of the joint and restrict its range of motion. And we also find an unusual feature called a meniscus, which is a type of cartilage that improves the fit between the proximal and distal heads of these two articulating bones. Other features include bursa, which are small fluid-filled pockets that contain synovial fluid. They're lined by synovial membrane and reduce friction and act as shock absorbers. Fat pads, which are localized areas of adipose that line the synovial membrane and protect articular cartilage. They fill in the space between the articulating bone. The meniscus is a pad of fibrocartilage that allows for variations in articular surface shape. So it's basically like a cup holder for the condyles of the femur articulating with the condyles of the tibia. Accessory ligaments support, strengthen, and reinforce the joint. Dislocation happens when the articular surfaces are forced out of position. So you can see here 
how all this works together. An inflammation of the bursa produces a condition called bursitis. Housemaid's knee, for instance, is an example of inflammation of the prepatellar bursa. Um, you've probably heard of athletes getting uh, damaged knees as a result of a blow to the knee joint that can rupture the ligaments that stabilize the knee joint. The two major ones are the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments that prevent the knee from sliding backward and forward. And if they rupture, what you'll have is an unstable knee joint. The lateral ligaments, okay, which include the, the tibial collateral and fibular collateral ligament, prevent side-to-side -side play in the knee joint. And they can also be injured when a blow is applied to the knee laterally or medially. Generally when this happens and the ligaments rupture, they either have to be replaced or they have to be sewn together and allowed to heal. Um, but this usually takes quite a long period of time because of the reduced blood supply to ligament connective tissue. Dense connective tissue has a white to pinkish appearance and that um, is one of the major components of ligaments and tendons. As a result, the ability to heal is restricted in these structures. Tendons heal quicker than ligaments. Ligaments sometimes do not heal at all.